thank you very much radhakrishnan sir and uh, welcome to all people who are listening in to this webinar and this webinar has been planned in a different way uh, because uh, as dr radhakrishnan said lots of us are now uh, aware of robotic surgery so we have given it a, you know a two fold uh, way of uh, treating this webinar one is we are giving you the basics of robotic surgery initially and thereafter we talk about very specific areas of robotic surgery and for that you know there are lots of things uh, there was a time when the national health service of the united kingdom almost stopped uh, permitting robotic surgery and because it was said that robotic surgery is only useful for prosthetic surgeries and nothing else and so they almost said that robotic surgery is out from the list of national health service but today uh, robotic surgery is gaining new avenues it's going passing through new areas and developing into something which is very precise very uh, uh, very good for the patient because it ensures better outcomes than normal surgeries so we take you through this journey in which first dr shanki garg is going to talk about general aspects of anesthesiology related to robotic surgery can you put up uh, dr shanki's uh, dr shanki please uh, share your first slide so yes, sir. let me tell you a little bit about dr shanki garg dr shanki garg is a relatively new but a very bright anesthesiologist uh, dr shanki uh, did her md from united uh, university college of medical sciences at uh, delhi thereafter she did her md in anesthesiology from pgi chandigarh after her md in anesthesiology she did a fellowship in liver anesthesia they were transplant anesthesia and thereafter after doing a fellowship she was working actively in a liver transplant unit at max veshali and now she has uh, come to amrita hospital where she will be a part of the liver, uh, liver transplant team and of course now we are also planning to start a lot of robotic work in the liver transplant unit so dr shanki is used to both robotic as well as liver transplant over to you dr shanki uh, thank you so much sir for introducing to me uh, are you able to hear me sir uh, yes yes uh, thank you so much sir uh, i will be basically uh, good first of all good evening to everyone uh, i will be basically talking about the basic anesthetic considerations for the robotic assisted surgeries uh, as we all know that the robotic surgeries are nowadays increasing so it is very important for a anesthetist to know about the basics of the robot how the robotic surgery works and what are the specific anesthetic considerations related to the robot assisted surgery so first of all coming to the uh, little bit of history of the robotic surgery so word robot has been derived from the word robota that mean uh, that means the forced labor so the machine which was forced to work for the human was called as the robo robot robot was first of all developed by the nasa for the use in space exploration however the first robotic surgery was performed was the lab police stack me in france first in 1987 by the sir moret uh now coming to the introduction how the robotic surgery has came to the uh, came into the picture uh, so uh, in 1990 uh, that was the revolutionary time when all the surgeons started practicing all the traditional open surgery by the laparoscopic surgery because of the various advantages of laparoscopic surgery over the open surgeries because of the reduced post operative pain because of the lower incidence of wound infection after after the laparoscopic surgery because of the uh, shorter hospital stay and better cosmetic outcome after the laparoscopic surgery however there there were certain limitations of the laparoscopic surgery which were further overcome by the robotic surgery so uh, what were the limitations of the laparoscopic surgery uh, there was uh, there is 2d vision of the surgical field uh, that impairs the depth perception the depth perception for the surgeon which was overcome by the uh, binocular system and polarizing filter that is present in the ro uh, robotic console and provides the 3d view of the surgical field 
how uh, uh, in laparoscopic surgery movements that we see of the surgeon are counterintuitive that means the movements which are done on the right side of the body are seen on the left side of the uh, screen however in robotic surgery movements which are done are intuitive so that is uh, uh, there is better ergonomics for the surgeon so uh, in laparoscopic surgery there is a, a camera which is held by the assistant and that is generally unstable however in robotic surgery the surgeon controls the camera held in the position by the robotic arm so the surgeon himself is controlling the camera so that is stable uh, in laparoscopic surgery there is reduced degree of freedom uh, there is a, a reduced degree of movement of the straight laparoscopic instruments and uh, uh, however because of the endoris technology in the robotic instruments near the tip of the robotic instrument uh, there is increased degree of freedom uh, that is the maximum degree of movement that can occur around a joint can occur in the robotic surgery that increases the further precision and the accuracy of the surgery uh, in laparoscopic surgery, surgeon is forced to adopt the uncomfortable postures while doing the surgery in deep uh, structure like pelvis. However, in robot, uh, in robotic surgery, the surgeon is sitting on a console and performing the surgery uh, uh, easily uh, in the deep structures also. So that provides a better ergonomics. Uh, in laparoscopic surgery, they say there is steep learning curve. However, in robotic surgery, there is shorter learning curve. So now coming to the, what is a surgical robot? Basically, a surgical robot is a self-powered computer controlled device that is programmed to aid in positioning and manipulation of surgical instruments to, uh, to enable the surgeon to carry, carry out the more complex tasks inside the patient's body. It is best described as the master-slave manipulator, uh, manipulators. Till now, the FDA has approved only two systems, uh, surgical robotic system. One is Da Vinci surgical system by the company Intuitive Surgical, and other was the Geo system, which was by the company Computer Motion. However, the later on, the Computer Motion company was taken over by the Intuitive Surgical company, and the production of Geo system was stopped. So the currently worldwide, the only uh, robotic system which is uh, available is Da Vinci system. Now coming to the uh, uh, Da Vinci's surgical robots, uh, what are the parts of this surgical robot? So uh, this is the photograph which shows that there is one console where the surgeon sits and uh, performs the surgery. And there is one surgical uh, surgical site cart or surgical site robot, which uh, which contains the surgical instrument and go uh, the this uh, uh, robot is basically uh, logged and docked uh, onto the patient's body. There is one vision card on which the monitor is present through which the other uh, person sitting inside the OT can see the surgical field. And generally, there is one assistant, assistant, uh, surgical assistant who is sitting near the patient to assist in the surgery. So, uh, parts of the robot, there is master console. In master console, there is a user interface with the stereoscopic eyepieces that provides the 3D view of the surgical field. And there are handles. Uh, in master console, there are handles that the surgeon uses to make the surgical movements. So, advantages of these handles are basically, uh, there is motion scaling and tremor filtering. So, what is motion scaling? Motion scaling means the large movements of the surgeon's hands are converted into the small precise movements of the instruments which are uh, inserted inside the patient's body. So that increases the precision. And there is tremor filtering. That up to the six hertz of the uh, tremors of the surgeon's hands are filtered uh, through this uh, tech, uh, through in the robotic technique. So that further increases the precision and accuracy of the surgery. There are three foot pedals in the master console that are used by the surgeon for adjusting the camera and for controlling the energy of the electrocautery or ultrasonic instrument used during the surgery. Then there is patient size surgical cart. So what is patient size surgical cart or the main robot uh, 
uh, what we say it has uh, it has four robotic arms which uh, that manipulates the surgical instruments which are inserted in these robotic arms and the uh, camera uh, that is uh, uh, through uh, that 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 instruments are put inside the patient body through the uh, laparoscopic ports so davinci system uh, hand, uh, hand, uh, handles the surgical instrument with the micro articulation near the tip so the uh, robotic surgical instruments had basically the endoris technology that instruments near the tip have uh, the uh, endoris that can duplicate the motion of the human wrist and there is seven degree of freedom that is the greatest movement around the joint that can occur so this is the patient size surgical cart with its four arms so one and two arm basically uh, 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 are the uh, uh, reflects the right and left uh, hand movements of the surgeon sitting on the console third is mainly for the camera so uh, earlier the the davin G system uh, patient size surgical cart has only three arms. The later on, the fourth arm was added for the uh, to uh, for the surgical assistant to work through this fourth arm, and uh, through these arms, these surgical instruments are uh, attached. These instruments had the this endoris technology at it uh, at its tip. Basically, because of this endoris technology, because of the micro articulations at the tip, uh, there there is an increased degree of movement, and that increases the precision and accuracy of the surgery. Then there is optical tower. It is a computer equipment which is needed to integrate the left and right optical channels to provide the stereoscopic view. It also has a monitor that allows the staff and assistants to observe the surgical, uh, surgical view. And it also has the instruments for the creation of the pneumoperitoneum. Now coming to the clinical applications of robotic surgery. Nowadays, all the surgeries are performed by uh, by the robot. Robot. Uh, the most commonly performed surgeries are urological surgeries. Among that, also most commonly performed surgeries are ARP, that is robotic assisted radical prostatectomy. Uh, 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 other than the RARP, the other urological surgeries like pyeloplasties, nephrectomies, uh, are, uh, cystectomies are also performed by the robot. Uh, nowadays, the gynecological uh, onco surgeries like total uh, hysterectomies are also performed by the robotic surgeries. In cardiothoracic surgeries, all the surgeries, including the coronary uh, coronary uh, revascularization surgeries, valvular surgeries, and lobectomies, all are performed by the robot nowadays. Because of the development of the small instruments, uh, nowadays the pediatric surgeries are also performed by the robot surgery. In GI surgery, starting from all the reflux surgeries, lap colies, and uh, splenectomies, colorectal surgeries, hepatectomies, all are performed nowadays by the robot. And then uh, there is transoral robotic surgery, which are uh, mainly ENT surgeries from thyroidectomy and tonsillectomy. Those are also performed by the robot. Now coming to the limitations of the robotic surgery, one of the major limitation of the robotic surgery is cost. Whenever it comes to the robot, so a robot itself is costly and then the instruments which are used in the robotic surgery are also costly. So that increases the overall cost of the surgery and uh, ro uh, it is a very uh, bulky, uh, robot is bulky, so it needs a large uh, operation theater to be kept uh, on the one side the robot uh, surgical side cart and console so uh, that is one of the limitation of and it takes time for the docking uh, for wheeling in and wheeling out of uh, to the robot Basic, and third limitation that is major limitation for the surgeon is a limited tactile sensation and less lack of force feedback to the surgeon so generally whenever a surgeon is performing su some surgery because of the touch sensation surgeon can differentiate between the normal and pathological structures but because of because here the surgeon is performing on a uh, through uh, the console so because of the limitation of the tactile sensation that uh, uh, sensation is absent absent and there is lack of that feedback to the surgeon 
now coming to the pre-op evaluation. So uh, being an anesthetist, how to evaluate a patient when we are uh, about to uh, perform the robotic surgery. Uh, so uh, uh, and there is no absolute contraindication for the robotic surgery. Mainly we have to identify the high risk patients and then the multidisciplinary decision has to be taken regarding the benefits and risk of the robotic surgery and anesthetic techniques. Um, there are some relative contraindication for the robotic surgery, like uh, patient, uh, morbid obesity, uh, in which the patient is not able to tolerate the uh, trend, uh, because most of the surgeries are done in steep trend number position and pneumoperitoneum effects can have the cardiovascular and respiratory compromise. So uh, the patient, if patient is not able to tolerate that, that uh, makes a contraindication for the robotic surgery. Then coming to the severe coronary ischemia and severe stenotic valvular heart disease, if patient had any significant respiratory disease and uh, if patient has uh, raised intracranial pressure or raised intraocular pressure. Patient with existing glaucoma are uh, the, uh, are the uh, the uh, it is a relative contraindication for the robotic surgery basically. Now coming to the intraoperative considerations. So um, the important intraoperative consideration is one of the spatial restriction. So uh, the robot is a bulky instrument, which is uh, there is patient side card, which is lying inside the operation theater. And then there is console, which is uh, there in the operation theater. So there is spatial restriction for the anesthet uh, anesthesia machine and table. And we need to adjust everything uh, according to the surgery. And then coming to the patient positioning. So most of the surgeries are done in steep tendon position so uh, we need and once the uh, once the robot is dogged uh, we cannot change the position uh, and we uh, the access to the patient uh, 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 reduces so we need to uh, make the proper position position before the robot is dogged and uh, we in may, had to make sure that patient is stable. So, and there are hemodynamic and respiratory effects of the pneumoperitoneum, which is created for the robotic surgery. And then there can be occult blood loss. Uh, it is especially important in prolonged surgeries uh, because the in uh, we are not able to judge the blood loss during the uh, these surgeries. And then duration of surgery. Do, uh, most of the surgeries are prolonged because of the uh, robot because it takes time for the v, uh, dock in the docking and undocking uh, in the robot and so the duration is prolonged so uh, that itself is a consideration now coming to the positioning uh, so whenever we are positioning a patient for the robotic surgery we need to protect all the compression uh, compression points and uh, for that we need to apply the gamges or the soft silicone gel pads around arms and around all the compression points and uh, we need to put the lubrication jelly in eyes and i need to be uh, taped with tegaderm and padded properly then shoulder support and horizontal bo uh, bars has to be applied to protect the face from the robotic arms and in all the cases trial of positioning has to be given especially in high risk cases because once we have created the pneumoperitoneum and we have done the strip tendon bug position so we need to uh, 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 we need to give the trial of strip tendon bug position so that uh, to see that patient is stable throughout because once the robot is dogged then it is difficult to uh, undog the robot and then uh, uh, change the position of the patient. And then there come uh, the one. Uh, there there is one uh, use of the secure fit. So secure fit is basically a rigid support frame which is used nowadays, and that fits to the OT table. And there is soft foam component uh, above it uh, that that is present around all the compression points. So we need not to put the separate gamges and silicone gels around the compression point. So this is one of the photograph of the secure fit which comes nowadays. So it has all these uh, uh, silicone gel, uh, this uh, soft form around all the compression points and the shoulder. Uh, uh, it also provides this, uh, uh, all uh, uh, protects the, all the compression points basically. 
Now coming to the effects of the pneumoperitoneum. So coming first of all, the cardiovascular changes due to the pneumoperitoneum that occur. There is phagic change in the hemodynamics secondary to the CO2 insufflation. Basically, whenever uh, CO2 is insufflated, so the cardiac index reduces by 50% after initial CO2 insufflation. Uh, that reduce uh, that is mainly because of reduced preload because of the IVC compression. And afterwards, there is increase in uh, systemic vascular resistance and um, MAP and uh, uh, central venous pressure. So central venous pressure and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure may rise during the pneumoperitoneum. Now coming to the respiratory changes that occurs due to the pneumoperitoneum. Uh, during the pneumoperitoneum, there is 30 to 50% uh, re reduction in the pulmonary compliance. There is reduced uh, forced residual capacity due to the uh, uh, elevation of the diaphragm. There is increased peak airway pressures, plateau pressures, and intrathoracic pressures. However, there is no changes in ventilation or perfusion. So it is very important to maintain the normocarbia and the acid-based uh, acid base balance. So whenever if there is increase in PaCO2 level or respiratory acidosis, we need to find out the cause that what is the cause for increased PaCO2. It may be because of the peritoneal absorption of the CO2 or uh, it may be because of the increased dead space in patient with if the patient has some coexisting lung disease uh, or patient may have increased metabolism or there may be inadequate ventilation or there may be subcutaneous emphysema while insertion of the trocar or by pneumoperitoneum creation or there may be CO2 embolism. So we need to rule out all these causes if patient develops uh, respiratory acidosis. Uh, coming to the other changes, uh, because of the, uh, there is increased cerebral blood flow and increased intracranial pressure. There is reduced portal vein flow, hepatic vein flow, and total hepatic blood flow through the hepatic microcirculations. However, there is no change in the hepatic artery flow. There is reduced gastric pH and gas, uh, mesenteric blood flow. There is uh, also reduction in the renal artery flow and venous flow and reduced medullary and cortical flow. So when, uh, whenever there is cardiovascular instability or hypoxemia on CO2 insufflation, it is, uh, it is important to exclude the causes and especially the cause like tube migration, which may occur, uh, tube may become endobronchial. So it is important to rule out these causes. But however, if patient remains unstable or uh, hemodynamically unstable or hypoxemic, uh, even after ruling out all the causes and it is uh, resistance uh, resistant to the application of the PEEP, then operation may need to be abandoned or converted to the open procedure. So therefore, it is very important in robotic surgery that after the pneumoperitoneum is created, we need, a, um, we need to give the trial of positioning before the docking of the robot so that if the decision has to be taken for converting it to the open or uh, uh, surgery, surgery has to be abandoned, that can be taken up before the robot is docked in. And uh, it is important to maintain the anti-tidal CO2 levels at the normal to reduce the risk of further uh, increase in cerebral blood flow or intracranial pressure. So uh, uh, coming to the other intraoperative consideration, like airway, we ne uh, need to have the standard induction and endotracheal intubation. Rice tube is generally inserted to decompress the stomach. And uh, venous excess, we need to have the two venous IV, uh, white bore uh, venous excess with the extensions because the, there is a limited uh, access to the uh, patient once the robot is dogged. Uh, so we need to have proper extensions uh, with the IV cannulas and uh, uh, ha um, uh, have it before the robot, uh, uh, robot is docked. And invasive blood pressure monitoring is only needed in high risk cases. It is not required in all the cases. And uh, uh, for the breathing, we need to uh, see for the effect of pneumoperitoneum with steep and number position. And always we need to check for the airway, IV lines, and monitor uh, monitoring leads that these are coming after positioning and before docking of the robot. 
now coming to the maintenance of anesthesia the pressure control ventilation mode is better than the volume control mode peep has to be applied because the uh, generally all the surgeries are occurring in the steep tandem bar position and with pneumo peritoneum there is uh, reduced frc and compliance and maintenance of anesthesia has to be done with the air and oxygen mixture and in robotic surgery it is important to have the complete immobility because even the small movements uh, during the surgery can lead to the catastrophic effects because uh, because the all the ro uh, robotic instruments are inside the uh, patient's body and robot is uh, docked so small movements can lead to the shear and catastrophic effects uh, uh, catastrophic events so patient need to have complete muscle relax and uh, uh, relaxed and uh, complete immobilized and uh, coming to the inhalation versus tiva uh, both are equally effective they say there is no dif uh, uh, no difference between the inhalational agents versus the total iv anesthesia uh, however uh, for the inhalational agents uh, for the prolonged surgery desflurane is used because that leads to the faster uh, recovery of the patient uh, uh, TIVA has been see, uh, seen to have better cancer outcomes than inhalation in uh, basically robotic oncological surgeries. However, the, the uh, TIVA versus inhalation, it is still controversial that it, uh, whether the actual uh, the outcome benefits are there or not. So analgesia has to be maintained with the multimodal analgesia. Uh, IV fluids, we need to have the restricted fluid therapy uh, because of the effects, uh, because most of the surgeries are occurring in steep and number position, it, it can lead to the dependent parts edema, which is one of the major complication after the surgery. So we need, and most of the surgeries are prolonged surgery. So we need to have the restricted fluid therapy uh, to avoid these post of complications. DVT stockings has to be applied to prevent the risk of the uh, embolism and forced air warmer. So uh, because most of the surgeries are prolonged surgeries, so we need to maintain the temperature. It is very important to avoid the hypothermia. And for that, we can use the uh, blankets, uh, warming blank, uh, blankets or forced air warmer to maintain the temperature. Now coming to the post-operative considerations. So most important uh, consideration after the robotic surgery is basically dependent edema. So dependent parts edema can become problematic after the prolonged surgery, especially in strip uh, head down positions. So laryngeal edema may occur and it may present as the respiratory distress and airway compromise. Overall incidence of reintubation after the robotic surgery is around 0.7% and delayed extubation is around 3.5%. But the incidence of air, airway edema may be up to 26%. So whenever we are suspecting airway edema, we need to perform the direct laryngoscopy and use the uh, cuff leak test before the extubation. And we may consider the airway exchange catheter for the extubation. So if patient has gross facial and periorbital edema, that is a indicate, uh, that is a indicated that patient may have the laryngeal edema and we should be careful while extubation. Now uh, coming to the cerebral edema. So patient may uh, develop cerebral edema uh, post uh, surgery. Uh, it leads to the confusion and reduced level of function as post operatively. Basic pathogenesis behind the cerebral edema is there is increased venous pressure in trend number position with pneumoperitoneum that leads to the increased intracranial pressure and capillary leak. So how to prevent this cerebral edema? We can limit the operating time. We may minimize the angle of trend number and we may uh, reduce the pneumo uh, uh, pressure intra abdominal pressure during pneumo uh, pneumoperitoneum to up to 8 mm of Hg and fluid restricted therapy has to be used and uh, maintaining a normal etco to further uh, prevent, um, can help in preventing the increased icp and if patient is at high risk and double uh, uh, cerebral edema, they may be electively ventilated post-operatively. So thank you so much, uh, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, Shanky. Uh, we'll have the questions and, uh, in the end. Uh, okay. uh, Shanky, uh, please answer. Okay. Yeah, and I, I request Dr. Uh, 
Khanna to Adu Khanna to please share his slides. Okay, uh, Dr. Shank has covered very comprehensively uh, a lot of things about robotic surgeries. And robotic surgeries, uh, this is what generally most of us know about robotic surgery and more of probably a revision for people who are um, already using robotic surgery or giving an, uh, delivering NSA of cases for robotic surgery. And, but it may be very useful for people who are not practicing robotic surgery and may require to practice uh, robotic surgery in the near future. So multiple problems are there while the learning curve is still on. And once the learning curve has been achieved, the anesthetic complications also tend to reduce. Uh, Gautam, please share your slides in the meantime. So, um, so th this is one thing. So uh, we have to remember one thing that uh, robotic surgeries uh, are not difficult for the surgeon once he has passed the learning curve. And they're not difficult for the anesthesiologist because he has learned, mastered the way to manage anesthesia during robotic surgery. So that is what makes a difference. We have the next presentation by uh, Dr. Gautam Khanna. Dr. Gautam Khanna will be dealing with robotic surgeries in the pelvic region. Uh, the pelvic robotic surgeries are the most common robotic surgeries which are performed. And uh, Dr. Gautam Khanna is uh, an alumnus of uh, Dehradun. And after their, uh, studying, doing his MBBS from Dehradun, he, was, he moved to the UK. In the UK, he uh, was a consultant. After he completed his FRCA, he worked as a consultant for many years. Then uh, for family reasons, he decided to move back to India. And he initially worked at uh, Saket City Hospital. Thereafter, he was working in uh, Medanta, the Medicity. And presently, he's working in Amrita Hospital. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gautam is mainly interested in the fields of robotic surgery and renal transplant surgery. And he was working in one of the most busy units of uh, uh, this side of surgery and along with Dr. Elawat in Medanta, the Medicity. And uh, now he's also uh, sort of initiating and establishing the unit here in Amrita. Over to you, Dr. Gautam. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, can you see my slides? No, it's, uh, it's we were we were we were seeing it. It just disappeared. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Right now it's right now it's. No, it's okay. Okay. Right. So in my presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, the general the general principles of robotic surgery, which has been very well outlined by Dr. Shanky. Uh, we'll start with robotic assisted prostatectomy, followed by uh, nephrectomy, uh, radical cystectomy, and robotic renal transplant, followed by a summary. So, in this, this is a typical operating room in our uh, in our operating area, and I just want the audience to actually consider the challenges we are facing in this operating room. The most obvious one is that the room seems to be very congested and full of people. So hence emphasizing the point that, um, that robotic surgery, the limit there, that there is limited access to the patient. As you can see, the patient is all draped in that, uh, in that robotic uh, drapes with arms on the top of the patient. So virtually no one can, can actually go to the patient in an emergency. Street cradle and birth position, which we, are, which we can see at the head end, pneumoperitoneum. It's the, the normal robotic uh, uh, surgery in the best of hands takes about two to three hours. Um, the fluid management as discussed by Dr. Chishanti can be challenging because there's always urine leaking and uh, they're always operating on that side. Um, and as I said, you know, uh, everyone concentrating on the robot. So uh, teamwork and communication, you really have to sh shout out if there's a problem. So coming on to robotic uh, surgery, the preoperative assessment of uh, robotic patients has to be very thorough because all of them belong to an age group which is more than 60, most of them, and may have significant cardiorespiratory issues. Another important thing to rule out is actually glaucoma and chronic back pain. And uh, it is now medical legally, it would be a very good idea to, uh, to, to say that there is no history of glaucoma 
Um, and the second thing which is most important is if someone has a, a slip disc and is made to be in a kind of a lithotomy position for two to three hours, uh, they will wake up in bad back pain. So, which is a common problem, which I, which we have experienced in our uh, uh, during my time in uh, Medanta. Uh, absolute contraindications are similar to that of any laparoscopic surgery. Um, relative contraindications are raised intraocular pressure, significant comorbidities, a large prostate size, and large median lobe, and a prior pelvic surgery, along with post ORP. In our center, uh, we normally do CBC, KFT, PT, INR, viral markers and urine routine and microscopy, along with ECG and echo for all ASA 1 and 2 patients. This is a routine thing, but you can have, one can add further investigation depending on the uh, age comorbidities of the patient. Um, patient positioning seems to be very important and it has been discussed earlier. Uh, what I have to add is that proper padding of pressure points uh, ne uh, needs to be done, which is obviously very uh, important. Uh, it is impossible to move the patient after docking. So every so the anesthetist should be very aware of this point that one cannot even be at any kind of a problem. You will not be able to have access to the patient. Another important thing is the chest binder, which is a heavy cloth which binds uh, the which binds the patient, uh, which is bound around the chest of the patient by an adhesive tape and a heavy cloth and cotton. It prevents the sliding down of the patient. Um, so, you know, when, when you have induced the patient, it's a good idea to document the airway pressures prior to apply, apply, applying that. And then looking at the airway pressures if they have, once the chest binder is applied. Because if there's a rise of airway pressures, then you can know that it is because of the chest binder and not because of any other thing. The arms and hand needs to be tucked to the side and slight flexion of the table at the hip joint uh, is, uh, is needed so that the, uh, the robotic arm can dock. So this is, a, this is, as you can see, a chest binder on the, on the deep picture, where you can see that uh, the chest binder is coming onto the arm and onto the chest, uh, which, which may uh, produce a picture like a restricted effect. So if that happens, the airway pressure will go up and you, all you have to do is loosen the, the tape. The other thing of note is one of the chair, one of the tapes of the chest binder comes across the arm. So that can lead to an erroneous blood pressure reading. So make sure that one has to ensure that the tape doesn't stick or is not tightly bound the blood pressure cuff. So arterial line is not normally needed under dictated by the patient's, uh, by, by patient's comorbidities. The blood pressure should be adequately sized. Um, we've spoken about chest binder. And uh, please remember that hypercarbia can worsen the cerebral edema, so the ventilatory parameters should be uh, adequately uh, optimized. Uh, the fluid management, as has been said earlier, should be um, should be uh, based on multiple. Uh, can be, is quite challenging, and the urine output can be influenced by multiple factors. Uh, steep Redenberg obviously causes facial edema, orbital edema. So one has to ensure that the, the leak test is done before that. And again, you know, that has an influence on your fluid management that you have to be restrictive. You, you, may, you, you should really practice restrictive fluid management. Uh, it's a relatively less painful procedure. Uh, most of the time people gen if adequately, uh, local anesthesia has been adequately applied and uh, non steroids have been given. Then normally patient wakes up very comfortably, except he has a catheter sensation, which he complains of, or if he has a pre-existing back pain, he, that's the normal complaints. Per se, because of the, um, the port insertion and the surgery, patients seldom complain of problems uh, because of that, if we have given adequate analgesia. Coming on to robotic assisted radical cystectomy. It is, it was the first one was done in 2003. There, are, there is a lot of discussion about extracorporeal and intracorporeal new blood formation. Uh, intracorporeal, intracor there are meta-analysis of four RCTs confirm low blood loss and low infection rates in the intracorporeal one. On the flip, flip side, the, the, as you can imagine, everything is happening inside. So it just is a very long procedure. 
But however, there's no di difference in length of stay, period of morbidity, post-op surgical margin yield, and lymph node yield in uh, in uh, radical uh, in robotic versus the open uh, surgery. Um, again, with intracorporeal versus extracorporeal, the complication rate is not much. Ninety-day complication rate is not much different, and robotic approach has does not improve the general survival or the um, or the outcome. But again, we have the benefits of what we have discussed earlier: relatively less pain, uh, relatively less painless as compared to open surgery, and the other benefits which go along with robotic surgery. And I said it for that is again a street prevalent Berg position. We have the challenge of pneumoperitoneum again. Uh, it's a 12, roughly in best of the hands. Again, it's around eight to 10 hours. With uh, So, um, you know, hypovolemia can happen secondary to near, uh, you know, uh, the surgery because the blood, because of the blood vessels uh, around that, hypothermia, again, because of long surgical time. So one must ensure two large IV band, uh, a bow cannula, what we, uh, an arterial line. Sometimes the surgeon requests a central line because of the TPN. Need for vasopressors is, is not really the indication for, uh, and this is not really needed if the patient is otherwise uh, doesn't have too many com comorbidities. So one can easily manage with two large IV bore cannula and arterial line. E uh, metabolic acidosis, secondary to fluid destruction, hypothermia commonly uh, encountered. And enhanced recovery protocol uh, is now is being no, increasingly followed in robotic surgery in many centers. So I just happened to take this from one of the centers uh, which practices the ERAS protocol, and it was published in British Journal. So uh, pre-referral uh, and outpatient assessment revolves around sorting out the core comorbidities, trying to get the patient in the best shape for the surgery. Then a preparation for surgery is involves taking consent. Uh, education, giving handouts, leaflets, making sure glaucoma is not there, and if there is a problem with the back, trying to sort that out. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in in uh, in uh, uh, in radical prostatectomies about uh, how to care about the stoma. So that's discussed initially on the preparation. Uh, generally, in England, the people are not uh, admitted a day before surgery because of bed concerns. They are admitted on the on the day of surgery. There is no bowel preparation. There's consent for the procedure done on the day of the surgery, and pre-medication is, is, is done uh, with the omeprazole and metoclopramide and oxycontin. Um, this is pretty much standard for all surgeries where, where there's standard in, in, uh, induction, um, lubrication to the eyes, single dose antibiotic, multimodal analgesia, and uh, VT prophylaxis and no routine use of drains, and everything is taken out, nasal gastric tube, et cetera, are taken out post-surgery. Uh, um, patient uh, has an extended recovery and early oral fluids, early mobilization is, is the key to discharge of the patient, and patient is pretty much discharged by day three, day four um, after the surgery. And along with that, they're given anticoagulation at home, and they can, there's a the regular, nurse which comes and sees them. So this is one example of the enhanced recovery protocol, which can be practiced not only in robotic um, radical cystectomy, but it can also be practiced in the RERP. Uh, robotic assisted nephrectomy um, can, is one of another, another surgery which is being done in robotic uh, in urology. Uh, standard treatment of masses of less than four centimeters, uh, robotic assisted partial nephrectomy, associated with low conversion rates, shorter warm ischemia time, because more or more patients, uh, the surgeons are able to have a 3D visualization. Uh, patients go in lateral decubitus position, with flexed uh, to 15 degrees to accommodate the arms. The standard monitoring is large bow IV cannulas, preferably two, because they can be blood loss, along with um, arterial line, and judicious use of perioperative fluids is associated with better outcomes in uh, post partial nephrectomies. Final, finally, I would like to discuss robotic assisted renal transplant. Uh, this was first started in 2001 and was first, the first one happened to be a cadaveric one. Um, uh, it came out of fashion because 
It was crit criticized for a long duration and cost involved. But now it is being increasingly practiced, especially in India, in many centers. And I think pre uh, preferably uh, the, 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 the data is pretty much limited in the West because there the most of these donors are deceased donors. Whereas in India, we have um, many live donors. So I think India has a lot of experience in uh, doing live donors and uh, robotic assisted gene transplant is gaining increasing popularity. Um, the benefits are specifically, again, the studies specifically show benefits in morbidly obese patients because the incision is small and their recovery is quicker. Uh, it's associated with lower rates of surgical site infection and have similar graft survival rates. The absolute concern indication, indication for this is multiple lower abdominal surgeries, calcified aortic iliac vessels, and inability to tolerate lower long period of pneumoperitoneum with steep head down position. The drawbacks of it are because it's a challenging surgery, limited experience and learning curve is still happening. That there are higher cold ischemia times, leading to long total ischemia times. And the longer the total ischemia times are leading to slow improvement in creatinine clearance. Again, the long-term data is still limited and to uh, and uh, because of that, this is not a widely recommended surgery. However, in experienced hands, which most of the centers in Delhi, like uh, Delhi and Sia, like Apollo, uh, Max and Medanta, there with the expertise, I'm sure the, the, the timings are relatively less and creatinine clearance improved much quicker than what has been described. So what is different? Pre-op assessment, again, apart from everything which we do for renal transplant patients, uh, the ability of patient to tolerate steep head down Treadlinburg position needs to be assessed and will he be able to tolerate the pneumoperitoneum? That that are the two keys, uh, two key points we need to look look into. Now, normally we put a twenty gauge arterial line on the same side as IV line, along with the CVP line. Again, the pa the patient then goes head down, uh, pump by uh, DVT pump support. Uh, we ensure uh, uh, adequate depth of anesthesia and muscle relaxation using uh, a muscle relaxation infusion. Uh, some people may use it, some people do not use it. Uh, in the wood, and some people would like to just use a scam, um, muscle monitor, a neuromuscular junction monitor, and give boluses. It's a single port technique. Um, and now coming up is uh, a single port technique. Again, um, there are some cost constraints, constraints, but it is a very, uh, it's an excellent technique where you put, put a single incision, and through that single incision, there's a drum which sits on it. And through that, all the robotic ports comes in for the dis dissection. The drum is then taken out um, and uh, the kidney is put through the single port, which I should show you the picture later on. Uh, we expect a longer duration of surgery, long ischemia times, uh, as I said earlier, delayed onset of graft function. Um, you know, with, with, as, as expected, the hypertensive response would be exaggerated especially in CKD patients who've been on dialysis, waiting transplant, which can be either controlled by esmolol and NTG infusion or dextromethamine infusion, whatever is the preference of the anesthetist. Fluid management can be challenging because there is this deep head, head down position, which can easily cause laryngeal edema. Um, so one has to be careful with that. Use of intraoperative cardiac monitor and lactate levels via arterial blood gas sampling can act as a good fluid guide. Um, the, the good thing with the new generation robot is that, uh, that you can undock very easily. The one which is in our hospital, which is the new XIA, um, it is very intuitive. Uh, so one, one can dock and undock pretty much in two or three minutes. Um, so release and lowering of pneumoperitoneum pressures during uretric anastomosis can be done. As I said, with the latest robots, you, your docking is seamless and undocking. So as a result, during ureteric anastomosis, patient can be made supine and uh, redock for uh, the anastomosis. Uh, occasionally, one may use um, norepinephrine or adrenaline for uh, graft perfusion, but most of the uh, surgeons don't like noradrenaline because of the vasoconstrictive effect and are happy to wait for uh, the urine to come because, um, because they, they feel that eventually it will. 
post undocking the uh, post undocking of the patient can be given intravenous fluid and filling can be done depending on the urine output and the patients are normally fast tracked and uh, monitored in the icu uh, so this is a single port robotic assisted uh, robotic transplantation is a renal transplant where as you can see there's uh, on the top left corner there's the uh, there is this insertion of uh, the single port 5 cm incision and through then a drum is put through which the robotic arms are put and we use the same drum with the same incision to put the transplant in kidney followed by uh, and some more uh, sorry for follow back closure so robots are increasingly are being used increasingly and they will become more uh, common uh, and for multiple surgery the thing which we need to be well versed with obviously the surgery but physiological impact of pneumoperitoneum and patient positioning of the surgery to uh, and understand the implication the only drawback is that there is still a learning curve uh, there will be lo leading to longer duration and increasing complication rates thank you thank you gautam um, yeah. and please and share yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gautam has very comprehensively covered uh, most of the uh, kidney diseases which have taken up for robotic uh, surgery. Uh, in the pelvic area, uh, a lot of work has been done in gynecological uh, surgeries also. A lot of gynecological surgeries, hysterectomy, especially for CA endometrium, are being done by the robotic approach. And the robotic uh, uh, approach uh, ha has definitely got better results, better outcome results. So this is what is probably going to be the future. And I know for sure in Delhi, uh, there are lots of hospitals which have not, not just one robot, but they've got multiple robots now. And more and more people are undergoing uh, surgery by the robotic method. And uh, as the expertise is developing, the results are much better today. As anesthesiologists, we are always worried about uh, one thing that is uh, atelectasis, which is invariably there. And uh, the respiratory disturbances which happen because of the steep positioning. But now uh, with improved uh, learning, improved awareness, we are able to overcome that also. And we are able to provide patients much better respiratory dynamics. Now we come to the third presentation. Dr. Shalu, will you please uh, share a slide? The third presentation is something unusual, which is not very commonly done with, uh, by the robotic method. And the third presentation is basically about robotic head and neck surgery and robotic chest surgeries. And uh, this is relatively less commonly done um, in, in our country, at least. Uh, even outside in the uh, Western world also, it is not very common to have your uh, uh, robotic surgeries for your <clears throat> neck, for oral surgeries, for thyroid surgeries, for uh, esophageal surgeries, etc. But now it is increasingly done. Uh, we have got quite a few done uh, in our units. And before we, uh, Dr. Shalu starts off uh, the topic, let me introduce Dr. Shalu Garg. Dr. Shalu Garg uh, is an ex-Navy person. She was in the Indian Navy for a long time. As an anesthesiologist, she had a brilliant uh, record as an anesthesiologist as, and she was the, uh, uh, she had received the uh, gold medal for topping MBBS in AFMC Pune and thereafter also was uh, first during her MD course at uh, AFMC Pune. And after that, she has worked in uh, uh, the major hospitals of the Indian Armed Forces, that is INHS Ashwini at Bombay and Army Hospital RNR at Delhi. Uh, and after uh, taking premature retirement from the Army, she worked with uh, Max Saket for a long time. Presently, she's working with us in Amrita. Over to you, Dr. Shalu. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for those kind words. I bring compliments from Amrita Hospital, Faridabad, and uh, I feel privileged to be a part of this webinar. So the topic which I will be discussing is anesthesia for robot-assisted head and neck and thoracic surgery. Dr. Shanky has given a very comprehensive uh, evaluation of the concerns which anesthesiologists face in robotic surgery. And Dr. Gautam has also highlighted some more points. So I will be sp sticking basically with what is specific to head and neck surgeries and the thoracic surgeries. So if you do a Google search to see what would be the bad things about robotic surgery, you will see that the headlines screaming are robot surgeons kill 144 patients. They cause hurt to 1391 patients. 
well, those kind of headlines can be very uh, off-putting for any patient. But we all know that more and more uh, role of robotic assist surgery is being seen these days. So the, coming to, first of all, the head and neck surgery, we find that transoral robotic surgery was approved by US FDA in 2009. However, the first reported human case was in 2005 by McLeod and Melder, where they conducted an excision of valicular cyst. What is important to note over here is that their setup time of robot was 75 minutes, whereas the surgical time was only 30 minutes. <clears throat> what are the applications of trans-oral robotic surgery? In malignancy, it is catching up a lot for head and neck cancers, especially those of base of the tongue, oropharynx, or the tonsils. Also for hypopharyngeal and laryngeal cancers not just the cancer surgeries, but also a lot of neck dissections, and then the reconstruction, which inevitably comes with most of the head and neck cancers. So people have reported applying local flaps with robot assistance, free flap covers. Earlier on, there were reports of free flap covers where there was a hybrid approach where the uh, vascular anastomosis was done in a conventional manner, and only the insetting of flap was done with robot. But off late, there are reports of people doing the complete free flap also with robotic assistance. Amongst non-malignant conditions, a lot of application is being found in surgeries for obstructive sleep apnea, for lingular, lingual tonsillitis, valicular cyst excision, and for thyroid surgery. Thyroid surgery primarily for its cosmetic reasons. I will discuss some of these surgeries in detail as I move on with my presentation. So what are the advantages of uh, transoral robotic surgeries for the operator? Again, I will be mentioning some points which have already been mentioned by my earlier speak, uh, colleagues also like uh, Shanky and Dr. Gotham too. Robotic arm movements, as has been told, they are much more controlled than a human hand. They can easily rotate in the tight spaces of the mouth. <clears throat> there is tremor filtration and seven degrees of freedom of instrument movement. Both of these things help in delicate dissection in the mouth and a much greater precision in excising the tumors. They are minimally invasive and the access is much less morbid as compared to most of the surgeries which we see for head and neck otherwise. There is better control of the bleeding and less blood loss again as compared to the open surgeries or the conventional surgeries for head and neck cancers. There can be shorter operating times if the surgeon has uh, developed expertise and overcome the learning curve. End block tumor resection is much more complete as compared to the open surgeries. The ability of two surgeons to operate within the field. This can be if there are two consoles and two surgeons sitting and simultaneously operating or what normally happens is one, major, one main surgeon is sitting at the console and there is an assistant at the head end to assist the surgeon with suction and uh, cautery of certain areas. I will be showing some pictures later on. There is reduction of operator fatigue and a proper hand-eye coordination, basically because of the 3D view which the surgeon gets because of the robot. This better visualization is magnified. There are high definition views, optimal view of the disease areas. Navigating around the corners of the mouth and the oral cavity is possible because of the angled scopes. Teaching and telesurgery is also extremely uh, useful with uh, transoral robotic surgery because of, again, a much better visualization and the learning curves definitely become favorable. So what are the advantages which transoral robotic surgery offers to the patient? There is decreased likelihood of tracheostomy, long-term speaking or swallowing issues for these patients. There is much less post-operative pain. The quality of life is definitely better because the scars are less visible and thus there is less physical dis disfigurement and therefore the psychological issues which most of these head and neck cancer patients face are also much lesser. Because of the ability of the robot to navigate into the deeper areas of the oral cavity, organ preservation and function preservation treatments are also possible. The hospital stay is much shorter and the faster return to normal diet and daily activities is possible. If you see the recurrence, the overall survival, the disease-free survival, and requirement of chemotherapy, TORS has definite advantage over conventional surgeries in every possible statistics which is mentioned over here. But there must be some disadvantages, of course. 
So transoral robotic surgery is approved for only a very limited number of conditions of head and neck cancers. And of all those conditions which are approved, not all patients would be appropriate to be offered TORS. Patients who have advanced cancers, patients who have difficult airway, either because of the size of the disease or because of difficult, uh, because of re restricted uh, mouth opening, there could be challenges in securing the airway for the anesthesiologist. And the small mouth opening can also make access and surgery difficult for the surgeon, also making the surgery a bit dangerous. Absence of sensory tactile feedback and palpation by the surgeon is not there, so he may find it a little difficult. And of course, not to mention the finances. Robots come at a cost. They are significant financial investment for any organization. Affordability by the patients could be an issue. So coming to some pictures, the pictorial story, an OT layout of a typical OT, which is conducting a tra transoral robotic surgery. As you can see over here, this is an operating table with the patient's head end over here. The three robotic arms are already docked inside the oral cavity. You will find the anesthesiologist with the anesthesia workstation at the foot end. The anesthesiologist normally induces a patient and rotates the table by 180 degrees with a long breathing circuit, long IV cannulas, etc., and a good monitoring setup. You can see the surgeon who's sitting at the console. This is the robotic arm which is docked. And this is the nurse which is helping the assistant who will usually be sitting at the head end of the patient with a uh, with the vision cut to his right where he can have a good HD vision and help the surgeon with suction and cautery, etc. So what are the anesthetic considerations? Again, I will not reiterate most of the points which have been earlier covered. There is an anticipated difficult airway in most of the transoral robotic surgeries for head and neck cancers. And it becomes more difficult because you are sharing the airway with a robot. And as we've already seen, a robot is a very cumbersome uh, object which is in the OT, occupying a lot of space. Access to the patient is limited. Therefore, IV lines have to have extensions, invasive monitorings as indicated. And because the access is limited, if at all, anytime airway problems arise, there is surgical hemorrhage or even cardiac arrest, we have to have protocols in place for emergency undocking of the robot because the you would like to access the airway and uh, set it right uh, at, or at the earliest. If there is hemorrhage, surgeon may want to access it and control it in a conventional manner. And of course, cardiac arrest will require resuscitation. So the local emergency undocking protocol and probably a practice run with the team is definitely in order. Significant hemorrhage, if occurs, can lead to asphyxiation or aspiration at the time of extubation, at the time of completion of surgery. So a general anesthesia for all these patients with very good muscle relaxation, again, as told by Dr. Shanky earlier, optimal surgical exposure is required because the oral cavity has a very small limited space and the surgeon will require to put in two robotic arms, prevent cuffing for the patient because it could lead to tearing of the tissues by the robot. Eye protection is extremely important by tape, goggles, padding, because a robotic arm will be moving over the face of the patient and can cause trauma to the eye and other parts. There is always risk of airway fire, so we need to be aware of it. Do not use FiO2 of more than 0.4. Have protocols in place in case there is airway fire, whether to extubate a patient or keep the tube in place, flood the area with saline, stop the cautery, etc. Airway edema, again, is a very well-known entity, especially if the surgery is on the, uh, in the oral cavity. So post-operatively, before extubation, maneuvers to assess the airway edema, leak around the tube, etc., must be carried out before deciding to extubate the trachea of the patient. A lot of surgeons would ask for Valsalva maneuver, basically to check for hemostasis. So we as anesthesiologists have to ensure that the patient does not have hypotension as at that point of time, because otherwise the results of Valsalva maneuver may not be uh, accurate. And Valsalva maneuver by itself also leads to hypotension should the fluid uh, administration should be adequate and the blood pressure should be maintained optimally. These all these patients will require nasogastric tube. Please ensure that the nasogastric tube is stitched onto the septum of the patient because it will remain in situ for a long time. Accidental pulling out of the tube, accidental dislodgement will not be acceptable because during the surgery or even after the surgery, repositioning of nasogastric tube could be a challenge. 
and it is mandatory, especially if there could be orosurvical communication as part of the surgical uh, complication, the NG tube will be required for a longer period for uh, enteral feeding of the patient. Opioid-based multimodal analgesia must be planned for all these patients for the post-operative period. So again, some more pictures. As you can see in this picture, <clears throat> the oral cavity of the patient has three arms of the robot. There is a 12 mm stereoscopic endoscope, which could be at an angle of zero degree or 30 degree. And these are the two 5 mm endo wrist instruments, which the surgeon sitting at the console manipulates to operate upon the oral cavity. Here you can barely see the uh, uh, endotracheal tube, which the anesthesiologist has placed. That's why I said it's a big fight between the robot and the anesthesiologist for the airway. Another picture here shows how the patient's eyes have been covered and padded so that these robotic arms do not collide and do not cause trauma. Here you can have a look at the endotracheal tube with a long tubing going towards the foot end of the patient. The assistant here is standing onto the right side of the patient with a suction in the oral cavity. Another picture here shows the assistant is sitting at the head end of the patient and helping out the main surgeon who's sitting at the console. What is important to note over here is the patient has to remain in a supine position. The position after the docking of the robot cannot be changed. So again, reiterating the fact that before handing over the patient to the surgeon and before the docking of the robot, we have to ensure that the airway is secured, the tube is well fixed, the circuits are in order, the IV lines, the monitoring lines, etc., are all well secured, well placed, and your patient is very well padded and uh, secured onto the table with a bang. This is a picture which is showing the two arms of the robot, the endoris, which have started the dissection onto the tonsillar pillar. Uh, I'm sorry, I could not find any video to put over there, which would have made it very easy to see how these endoris move inside the oral cavity. Coming to the second surgery, transoral, it's thyroid. A uh, lot of surgeons have looked at a lot of approaches for the thyroid, primarily to overcome the large incision which a patient may have onto the anterior part of the neck. So this first picture shows a transoral approach to the thyroid. Here again, inside the oral cavity, you can see three arms of the robot which are accessing the thyroid. To be very frank, I have not uh, given anesthesia to such a procedure and I was having a conversation with the surgeon. Uh, he says that this is not a very happy procedure for the surgeons because access to the thyroid and access to the vessels around the thyroid is uh, quite limited in transoral approach to the thyroid surgeries. The, the second approach for the thyroid, again, is a retroauricular approach. This is a much better and more comfortable approach for the surgeon. Here you can see this is what the incision looks like. And this is how the, three, the arms of the robot will be placed for accessing the thyroid. Here the surgeons find it much more easy to access the thyroid gland and operate upon it. The third approach can be transaxillary approach to the thyroid. Here you can see the patient has been anesthetized. The arm of the patient is abducted and placed over the head so that uh, if you see in this picture, the hands have been taken above the head and abducted and uh, they have been padded well fixed. And this is how a flap is raised in the axilla and the robotic arms are placed. Again, we have to ensure that the arm is kept away so that it doesn't collide with the robotic arms. All these procedure processes have been basically done to, again, like as I have said, for cosmetic purposes. Coming to thoracic surgery, what are the robotic assisted thoracic surgeries which, have, which can be performed? A lot of indications are there these days. Surgeries on the esophagus for the esophageal cancer, lung surgeries, surgery on the thymus and mediastinum, fundoplication and cardiac surgery. I will not be touching upon uh, the cardiac surgeries. I will show a couple of pictures and highlight us a few things about the esophageal surgery, lungs and thymus. So, Robotic assisted minimally invasive esophagectomy. This was first developed in 2003 and a lot of expertise has been gained by most of the surgeons because from initially open esophagectomies, which included thoracotomies, etc., the surgeons had already moved on to lap assisted esophagectomy, which included VATS, basically visually assisted thoracic dissection. This had made life much, much simpler for the patient as well as anesthesiologists because the post-operative recovery was very well. Now with the uh, coming in of robot over laparoscopic surgeries, uh, the robot-assisted minimally invasive esophagectomy is gaining a lot of uh, 
uh, popularity. So what are the advantages? It has less of cardiopulmonary complications because you are not really doing a thoracotomy, less post-operative pain, shorter ICU stay, much better post-operative functional recovery for a patient, better quality of life, and faster trainee learning curve. This faster training learning curve, which has been again earlier expressed, is uh, basically because as compared to laparoscopic surgeries, the robotic surgery allows the surgeons to have a very good seven-way endo-wrist kind of a movement. The 3D imaging is of a superior quality. The free articulation of the tips of robotic arms, precise and better lymph node dissections around the bronchi, around the mediastinum, into the abdomen, and it also reduces nerve injury, especially the recurrent laryngeal nerve. <clears throat> what are the disadvantages? Well, the access to the patient is limited for the anesthesiologist in particular. Therefore, again, highlighting the fact that emergency undocking mechanism must be in place. The team should be aware of the protocols. Mostly airway problems arise where the tube may get dislodged or the uh, one lung ventilation may be compromised. Surgical hemorrhage is a big issue. Cardiac arrests have also happened on table. Surgical hemorrhage could be of a massive uh, of massive significance, leading to a sudden exsanguination. Subcutaneous emphysema, pneumothorax, pneumobidiastinum, gas embolism, mostly because of pneumoperitoneum and artificial pneumothorax, which is created for the thoracic part of the dissection. Positioning neuropathy. I will just show the positions so and also highlight the parts which need to be taken care of to avoid this neuropathy. Hemodynamic problems mainly occur when the thoracic dissection is happening for the esophagus. The surgeon works very close to the heart and the pericardium. So the patient may have arrhythmia and hypotension. Amongst the anesthetic considerations, I cannot highlight enough the preoperative evaluation of all these patients who have CA esophagus. They could be most, they could be post chemotherapy, post radiotherapy, therefore, a cardiac evaluation is a must. Because of the age, they could have coexisting diseases, a pulmonary workup and a pulmonary function test is, is uh, very much indicated. Preoperative rehabilitation in terms of improving their physical uh, uh, abilities, uh, incentive spirometry, smoking cessation has to be impressed upon, though you will be surprised how many patients cheat on this issue. They would have smoked right in the morning of surgery and come for the surgery. Medical optimization for any uh, underlying uh, medical diseases like diabetes mellitus or coronary artery disease, stress, etc., must be done like any, any other anesthesia delivery. This is uh, an OT layout for what a typical robotic assisted esophagectomy would look like. Here, as you can see, this is the, the operating table with the patient in the lateral decubitus position and the robotic arms are docked. The anesthesiologist here remains at the head end of the patient with, its, with his own, his or her own monitoring devices. The surgeon is sitting at the console. The assistant is on to the right side of the patient assisting the surgeon. He has a HD view over here for him, which is also being taken, uh, which is also being used by the nurse, which is on the opposite side with all the instruments and everything for the patient. If you have a look at a real-time operation theater, like Gotham said, a robotic OT generally looks very, very crowded. And most of the corporate hospitals have really not invested in space inside the OT. And with the placement of robots inside those small theaters, it makes even more crowded. We are though very lucky at Amrita Hospital where our OTs are huge in size and this kind of space constraint is much lesser. So here you see the patient is again in a lateral decubitus position and all the forearms of the robot are docked and there is just no place to access the patient if you would want to. So what are the anesthetic considerations? It's general anesthesia with regional anesthesia, preferably to take care of post-operative pain. Thoracic epidural or bilateral paravertebral block both work best. Thoracic epidural though may have some instances of hypotension. Intubation for thoracic part of esophageal dissection, a left-sided DLT has to be placed because one lung ventilation is required for putting the lung down and easy uh, viewing of the esophagus for dissection. After the thoracic dissection is over, the abdominal part, for the abdominal part, the tube may be changed to a single human tube. Positioning of the patient, again, for thoracic, the patient would be in left lateral decubitus position, tilted to 45 degree or more onwards to the prone position. 
Some of the surgeons that I have worked with, they prefer prone position for thoracic dissection, which is also fine for us where we avoid putting in a double lumen tube or a one lung ventilation. With small amount of pressures of artificial pneumothorax and by uh, gravity itself, the lung settles down and with a smaller tidal volume, we are able to uh, allow the surgeons a much better view of the esophagus. Then for the abdominal dissection, the patient is made supine and uh, in reverse Trendlenburg position. So again, long IV tubings, invasive monitoring as indicated, ABGs, especially during the thoracic dissection because of the one lung ventilation, etc. Artificial pneumothorax, carbon dioxide insufflation can uh, cause its own problems of uh, difficult ventilation uh, requirement of uh, also uh, uh, one, carbon dioxide insufflation for pneumothorax along with one lung ventilation will have problems of ventilation as well as oxygenation. So we need to look into the FiO2 which we are giving to the patient and the tidal volumes which we are giving. Again, now some more pictures. This picture shows the trocar placement for the abdominal part of the uh, robotic assisted uh, esophagectomy. As you can see, there are five ports over here. The first one here is the arm, the 12 mm port, which is for the robotic camera. The three arms on the sides, the arm one, three, and four are the endo wrists, which are in control at the for the surgeon who's sitting on the main console. The fifth port here is the assistant port, through which the assistant is able to do suction, place in the uh, endo, uh, place in the clips, etc. And there is one more small port at the epigastric region for retraction of the liver while the surgeon is operating upon the gastroesophageal junction or doing esophageal resection or dissection around the diaphragmatic uh, area. This picture shows the placement of the trocars during the thoracic part of the dissection. The patient is in lateral decapitous position, almost prone. The C, uh, which is marked over here, is the camera port. It's a 12 mm port. The surgeon has access to two robotic arms or an endo wrist. And this third port is for the auxiliary, uh, auxiliary port for the assistant to use the suction and assist the surgeon. There is one more uh, method of doing it, which is through single port. Again, this is much uh, better because there is one incision given in, uh, in the uh, intercostal region and a gel pad is put onto the patient where all the three ports go in together. This, uh, of course, is a little more costly for, this, uh, pati uh, for the patient, but then with one port, you are able to achieve the same effect. Now, this is the picture of an operating theater, what it normally looks like. This is the abdominal phase, which I have shown. The robot remains onto one side. So onto the left side, as you can see, the patient is in a reverse Trendlenburg position with the robotic arms docked and the surgery is in progress. So there are some concerns during the abdominal phase, which we have to, be, uh, have to keep in mind during the transhiatal dissection. The pleura can be opened, so the ventilating pressures can go up. There could be tension pneumothorax as well as hemodynamic instability. So we need to reduce the insufflation pressures for the pneumoperitoneum. We could need to increase the airway pressures to be able to ventilate the patient adequately. If we have a high uh, uh, concern for it, and if we think that the pleura is likely to be open, a left-sided chest drain can be placed prior to proceeding with the abdominal phase of the dissection. More so because after the abdominal phase is over, the patient is going to go into lateral decapitous position and will not be accessible. The left side of the chest will not be accessible. We must remember to pull back the nasogastric tube before this conduit is made and also reposition the nasogastric tube under vision while the anastomosis is going on. Another picture of the thoracic phase of the robotic assisted esophagectomy. Here, as you can see, the patient is in left lateral decapitous position. The robot being on the left side helps. You do not have to manipulate the table too much. You can simply turn the patient to the lateral position. Now here I wanted to say some things. A lot of surgeons would like to do the thoracic part of the dissection first, followed by the abdominal part. But when I was going through the literature, there are equally large number of uh, surgeons who do the abdominal part first, followed by the thoracic part of the dissection. So here the patient is in left lateral or almost prone position. And again, you can see a very crowded OT. This is the nurse, this is the anesthesiologist and the assistant who's helping out the surgeon. 
a few uh, words to be mentioned about the patient's position in the lateral decupitus position. As you can see over here in the lateral decupitus position with the uh, band which is tightened so that the patient doesn't roll over, he's fixed onto the tube. This is the area where the surgeon would normally be putting in the ports. So it's a lot of fight for us to be putting our ECG leads because you know the patient is first in a patient is going into the lateral decupitus position and then patient is going to go into the supine position for the abdominal phase. And sometimes if the anastomosis of the esophagus has to be made onto the left supraclavicular area, then that area is also inaccessible or not available to the anesthesiologist. So we have to think very carefully as to where we place our ECG leads, which sides we take in our invasive lines and invasive monitoring like the uh, central venous cannulation especially. Now here, if you see the uh, left axilla of the patient is compressed. So we need to put a roll under the left axilla so that the compression of the vessels and nerves do not happen. And similarly, the right side, right arm, you see, it has to be uh, kept in a neutral position, should not be stretched too much in the cephalic direction because it can cause direct stretch of the brachial plexus and neurac neurac uh, neuropraxia can happen. A lot of surgeons will insist upon you having moved the arm much more cephalic. Please resist, keep the arm in the neutral position in abduction because uh, and keep it at a lower level so that it doesn't uh, collide with the robotic arms once it starts uh, working onto the thoracic part of the patient. <clears throat> the machine remains at the head end and all your lines will have long tubings and long extensions for uh, ease of administration and ease of access. Then some of the problems which you could encounter during thoracic phase of esophageal dissection are cardiac rhythm abnormalities, mostly because a lot of work happens around the heart and the pericardium. Compression of the heart can lead to hypotension. Compression of the major vessels can lead to hypotension. So you have to keep a, uh, you have to keep a watch on that. Insufflation pressures will lead to high ventilating pressures. Like I said, the artificial pneumothorax, though the surgeons use about five to six millimeters of pressure, one lung ventilation, therefore adjust your ventilatory settings and the FiO2 like any other one lung ventilation you would do. Injury to pulmonary veins and aorta is a reality. I have experienced both these instances in the OT and I can only tell you that the patient exsanguinates in no time. And a very good uh, surgeon to uh, control this bleeding and a very good uh, transfusion department to be able to supply the blood and blood products is a must other than the fact that you have to keep your wits about you. Then injury to the trachea and bronchi are also a big reality. Therefore, the firm pressure on the membranous part of the trachea and bronchi should be avoided. A few pictures showing the dissection here. If you can see, this is the thoracic part of the dissection happening. This is the lung, which has collapsed because of one lung ventilation. This you can see is the uh, bronchus, which is visible. The surgeon has started to dissect out and expose the esophagus over here. You can make out the endo wrists of the robot, how easy they look to manipulate and they are much more easier to manipulate as compared to the laparoscopic instruments. Another picture here showing the azygous vein very well and the two hemologs which have been applied onto the azygous vein to control it. Coming to the next uh, thoracic robotic assisted thoracic surgery, I'll be talking a few things about thym thymectomy. The most commonly performed uh, indication is for myasthenia gravis. It's a safe and feasible surgery. Robotically, it is very easy to manage. Intraoperative hemodynamic and pulmonary parameters change, but they do not really have much impact on the outcomes for the patient. Enhanced recovery after surgery is a must. Gotham has highlighted a lot of things uh, with respect to urological surgeries. Nothing very different happens for most other surgeries for ERAS with respect to the drugs, the fluids, analgesia, antibiotic, and thromboprophylaxis. ICU stay may not be mandatory for these patients if the surgery has gone off well and if the disease is well controlled. So what about the preoperative evaluation? Like any other surgery, the other things which are specific to the patients with myasthenia gravis is that their myasthenia gravis should be optimized preoperatively. A good neurological assessment is mandatory. The drugs which need to be given or not need, required to be given preoperatively are the drugs for myasthenia gravis must continue till the time of surgery. We should avoid sedative free medication to these patients. And if these patients are on steroids, then hydrocortisone must be given. 
It's general anesthesia with double lumen tube and one lung ventilation. Monitoring, we have to decide with respect to the patient's condition, whether you require invasive monitorings or monitoring or not. Uh, it's like not very different from the regular surgeries we do. Post-operative analgesia also has to be planned very well. A few pictures here again. As you can see, the position of the patient for thymectomy would be left side up with a 30 degree angle. A pad is placed 30 degrees and arms are placed carefully by the side. Here you will find that the arm is a little lower level than the patient's body. The patient is again strapped up well and the arms are padded well and they should be covered with uh, gauze rolls, etc., to prevent hypothermia. Again, this arm is required to come at a lower level so that it doesn't collide with the robotic arms once the robot is docked. This is the picture which shows the placement of the port. Again, here you see the first port is the camera port. It's a 12 mm port. It's in the fifth intercostal space between the mid and anterior axillary line. The two arms with the surgeon at the robotic console, one is in the fifth intercostal space, midclavicular line. The other one is in the third intercostal space, axillary line. And the fourth is an accessory port or the assistant port, which is required, which is being used by the assistant again to introduce the clips for the hemologs or for any staplers and suction, etc. The next surgery which I will be touching upon is robotic assisted thoracic surgery for lung indications, mostly for lung cancers. The first robotic assisted thoracic surgery for lung cancer was uh, done in 2000 time, 2002. Thereafter, a lot of progress has happened and a lot of surgeries are being taken up with robotic assistance. Again, like I mentioned for the thymectomy, for the esophagus, the surgeons have progressed very fast from uh, video assisted thoracic surgery, that is VATS, to robotic assisted surgery because of the inherent advantages as we've been talking about. So what are the various types of procedures for lung cancer which the surgeon could undertake? Number one is a wedge resection where just a small wedge of the lung can be resected. Segmental resection, which is a little bigger than the wedge resection, but smaller than the lobectomy, which is happening. So all these surgeries can be undertaken by robot assistance. Again, I will not uh, take up much time with respect to the preoperative evaluation, cardiac pulmonary workup, medical optimization, pre-op rehabilitation. General anesthesia plus regional anesthesia, double human tube, one lung ventilation, contralateral decubitus position, upper extremities and flexion and holding the pillow. I will just show a picture which will give you an idea about the positioning. The complications all remain the same, bleeding, tissue damage, pneumothorax, bronchopleural fistula, etc. <clears throat> This is what a normal OT layout would look like. The patient is in lateral decubitus position. The robotic arms are docked. This main surgeon is sitting at the console. I'm sorry, the anesthesiology, the anesthesia machine and all is missing. Please don't hold it against me over here. This is just a uh, depiction. This is what I meant by the lateral decubitus position. Again, the upper arm of the patient has to be carefully positioned so that the brachial plexus does not get stretched and there is no neuropraxia. This is the place where the ports will be placed by the surgeon. As you can see here, the four ports are in place. One would be the camera port and the two will be the endo, uh, the robotic endo ports. To summarize, in Hunterian Museum in London, there is a primordial robot, Winchester's uh, saw, which was invented in 1850. And there is a plaque which says, unsurprisingly, didn't catch on. However, today's robotic tools are light years away. We have found very sophisticated uh, development in the robotic tools with artificial learning, artificial intelligence. It has become much more better. Therefore, the advantages of robotic assisted surgeries are being accrued by most of the surgeons and the role is only expanding each day for more and more surgical conditions. Very sick patients are also being offered this option now because of the advancements in the surgeries, the surgical expertise, and of course, the expertise of the anesthesiologists. Robotic assisted surgeries found enhanced interest during Corona pandemic also, because the surgeon realized that he can sit almost two meters away from the patient and he feels extremely protected. So the, a lot of robotic surgery has started to happen post pandemic. Thus as anesthesiologists, what is our requirement? We really need to be abreast with the advancements which are happening and the challenges in managing these patients. We have already been uh, uh, helping out in a lot of laparoscopic surgeries, the VATS, et cetera. So switching over to robotic is not really very difficult if we know a couple of challenges of robotic, especially patient which is inaccessible, uh, 
a very early undocking of the robot if there is an emergency which arises. And uh, I suppose uh, anesthesiologists will do good. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Shalu, for a, again a wonderful talk and uh, exposing people to thoracic and oral surgery, which is uh, I, I'm sure most of the people who are attending will not have been would not have been exposed to these kind of surgeries. And it would be a great uh, I'm sure a, gr a great uh, way of to think under something which is going to enlighten them much more. And I'm sure they will themselves face these surgeries in the next five years. I'm, I remember when I was first exposed to uh, uh, robotic prostate surgery in the early 90s, I was very scared when I had uh, heard Dr. Um, Malotra uh, in, uh, from New York talking about robotic uh, surgeries and uh, thing, I was very scared about all the complications which would occur. Then, uh, I, when, but what has been pointed out by all of you is that the learning curve is very short. Then uh, I'm talking about a decade later, that's in, in 2010s or so, I saw surgeons who knew how to do laparoscopic surgeries, but could not do open surgeries. They said, no, we are, we are not comfortable doing open surgery. We have we never been taught. And uh, in the last few years, one or two years, I've come across surgeons who are not comfortable doing laparoscopic surgery or open surgery, just, they just can't do it, they refuse to do it. They say, we don't do it, we can only do robotic surgery. Surgeons have progressed to that. I'm sure we'll also progress to that. Today, um, especially the uh, surgeries of the thorax and the oral cavity seem very difficult from the anesthetic point of view, but I'm sure we'll also get comfortable uh, very soon. Our learning curves are probably longer than the learning curves of the surgeons because uh, for them it's easier probably. But our learning comes are more difficult. I'm sure we shall also overcome. It's the, I remember the song, we shall overcome. And uh, that is what we have to remember. We shall overcome all these problems and uh, maybe uh, find it much easier after a few years. I, 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 can, I cannot see any questions which are there from the participants. Uh, any questions? Uh, uh, Sagnik, any questions from your side? Sir, uh, from one second, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, from our side, uh, there is no question as of now. I just checked the website. Okay. So we on our Clarnet website, there is no uh, there is okay. no questions as of now. Thank you, thank you, Sagni. So uh, you. with that, uh, we come to you know uh, from the we conclude the webinar part of the uh, the thing, and we have talked about uh, robotic surgery. I thought we would be a little different from what normal robotic surgery webinars would be, and I'm sure we have made a difference. And with these words, I would like to hand over to Dr. Baljit Singh for his concluding remarks. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Nicole. Well, yes, you made a lot of difference uh, to the conduct of the webinar. Very interesting webinar, a lot of new information that uh, you know I can say. Uh, personally uh, saying, I mean, I haven't heard about, uh, heard of the robotic surgery for thyroids and uh, you know, uh, the various approaches, uh, of course, they're all new to me. I had heard about thoracic, uh, you know, uh, uh, this esophagectomy and all that. Uh, although the most of the, uh, you know, uh, knowledge about uh, about robotic surgery in general is about the abdominal surgery, start with prostatectomy, then of course, all kind of abdominal organs, uh, you know, coming even to uh, <laughs> renal transplants, uh, liver transplant, of course, is, uh, a lot of centers are doing it. Uh, thank you so much to all the three speakers. Wonderful presentation, great presentation, a lot of new information. And I would uh, like to thank Dr. <laughs> for the anesthetic considerations in general that she started with. Very nicely explained for all, and that set the, uh, had set the tone for the uh, subsequent speakers. Uh, thereafter, Dr. Gautam Khanna, uh, you know, uh, elaborated on on uh, genital uh, surgeries, uh, which are you know quite. Uh, commonly done these days. And then, of course, Dr. Shalugat with her uh, newer uh, applications of the robotics in, in surgery. Well, uh, you know, uh, she uh, had one uh, line, Winster's dump saw, which uh, didn't catch up. I must say that, yes, uh, the robotic surgery has caught up, and we'll uh, probably hear more and more of this in the coming few years. And uh, uh, thank you so much for the uh, wonderful presentations. And I think uh, the very fact that there are not many questions because uh, they, they were all kind of overwhelmed with uh, the new information that you provided, very interesting application of the robotic surgeries. And that uh, may be the reason for that. Thank
Thank you so much for all this. Uh, Thank you. Three speakers. Of course, uh, Dr. Thank Mukherjee you. Is very nicely uh, uh, moderating the whole uh, discussion. And on behalf of uh, uh, the president, uh, my personal self, and of course, uh, Dr. Adhikrishan, I thank all the three speakers for their presentation and looking forward to having them, having all three of them again in some forum, uh, you know, for ICA webinars. Thank you so much and good night, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you everyone.